Yeah, I think it does um, because, you know, like I said, it's not just he's a popular guy. It's just that, you know, they know what he's gone through. They live it and breathe it. You know, they see even a guy like Sess, Ryan Sess, and I'm going through on a daily basis. And, and, you know, it's a constant reminder to, to all the players that, you know, it's 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 sometimes a fickle world they live in where you can do everything right and still fate will sort of point its finger at you and make things difficult. And, you know, it's why every time they're out there training, I expect them to be training even on a cold day like this with a smile on their face because there's an alternative to it, you know, and they've got guys living and breathing that. So, um, but, you know, it's they're, they're a pretty close group. Um, they certainly have become close in recent times and they all felt, you know, you could see it even on the day, you know, at the game, you know, that the, they really felt, you know, for what he went through and um, quite emotional about it. But, you know, I think his demeanour helps because he's just, like I say, such a positive guy that, you know, they, they know he's going to be back. Oh, nothing really changed. I mean, I, I said half the game, I think it was a great tackle, but you let the, the referees and the officials deal with that and... Uh, from our perspective, it was dealt with on the day. Um, Andrew, you'll probably be aware that Spurs have beaten City in five of the last seven league games, and they have done it in a style that's kind of nothing to, to what you're doing. Mm. Um, is there anything you can take from looking back at those games? I mean, will you, will you watch those games and look back to them or not? Um, well, I think there's a reason I'm sitting here. And the reason is that the end game is not to beat City. Yeah, because like you said, if that's the end game, then that's been done. Now, there's a reason I'm sitting here. So, no, is, is a short answer. Not because I'm dismissive of that, because it's, it's a hell of an achievement to knock them off. Absolutely. But it's not why I'm here. It's not the end game. It's not, like I said, it's not, I'm not trying to set up a team to beat Manchester City. I'm trying to set up a team to be successful. And, you know, if that was enough what you're suggesting, I wouldn't be sitting here. There'd be somebody else sitting here. So I take that as a kind of pointer to me about... And and look, like, uh, it's not... Like I said, I understand why people would, would kind of think that way, and it's a legitimate question. Why wouldn't you do it if you, if you know it's going to be successful? But um, I don't think I was appointed... Well, I'd be surprised if I was appointed and people would expect me to go down that route knowing who I am and sort of what I stand for as a, as a manager. Are you conscious that that kind of successful record in the city from outside the Spurs bubble, I guess, mm. provides way to provide scrutiny to the way you think about it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, you know. We need to be scrutinised. I need to be scrutinised. I need to be questioned. And like I said, that's what tests my resolve. I ain't going to change, but... Bring it on! It's it it because it, it, it doesn't just test me; it tests the players, it tests the club. You know how 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 resolved are we about doing this? Because it's you're going to go through. Like I said, you look at all the top teams; they've all been through this process, through the tough times. They all got questioned, they all got scrutinised, they all got you know um, they're all had criticism come their way. How did they handle it? You know the ones that are sort of through the other side, and how did other ones? who handled it differently, where are they now? Um, I think there's, there's always indicators there, but, you know, it's 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 maybe not as exciting to to kind of not buckle at this time. It might be seemed a bit sort of boring to say, well, no, why is it just, why didn't it change? But I just, it's not because I'm, you know, like I said, I, I, I have a real strong belief in what I do and where we're heading and I'm just not going to waver from it. Um. Hey, John. You joined CFG as a coach at your second job outside of Australia. Mm. How important was that, and, and what was it like working for this sort of global organisation? Yeah, look, it was it, it was good. We, we, you know, obviously, it was it was a bit of a it's not it wasn't your typical sort of um, you know CFG sort of club because they didn't have total control of it, so there wasn't the same sort of um, you know interaction and influence that there is at other clubs. But it, it did expose me to some brilliant people in there and the way they work. And um, you know, I was fortunate. I mean, I'll be forever sort of indebted to, to Brian Marwood. He was kind of the first one who kind of noticed me out in Oz, and you know, we we. We started sort of a you know a relationship back then in terms of him 
sort of following my career and he was the one that sort of pointed me towards Yokohama when I left the Australia and um, it was because, you know, obviously they, they had a club in Australia at the time and he'd make frequent visits and, you know, he's been a, a real source of support for me all the way along um, and within that, you know, I got to visit City and watch him train and, and met Pep and um, I think Mikel was there at the time and, you know, the way they worked. So it, it, it was... Um, it was sort of, um, I guess, for, for somebody like me, it was, uh, gave me some belief in myself that other people could see what, you know, um, on this side of the world anyway, that, you know, what I was doing had some merit. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was great to just be able to interact. And then, you know, my main interaction was with people behind the scenes there around recruiting and, you know, around their, their methodology. And it was great just to have that access of information, which, you know, is not afforded to everybody so um i said i'll, I'll forever be we sort of indebted particularly to i said to, to brian marwood for for sort of the journey i've been on this isn't meant to sound obsessive but do they, do they have ffp there did they back you in the transfer market during during this period? yeah it was it was different like i said it was um because you know they've, they've only got a sort of 20 percent share of the club so it's not like they kind of make all decisions there but when it came to our foreign recruitment we you know i could lock into their database and they literally had you know just about every football in the world tracked and to, it's fair to say i wasn't competing with the same players as them our budget was a bit different but um just being able to access the information they had at the time and say look you know this is what i need and talking to the people behind the scenes there were brilliant um you know, allowed me then to, to sort of make decisions around uh, particularly foreign players, which ones we bring in and just the way they worked within that context because those kind of, like I said, you know, not many people are sort of exposed. Although, you know, the, the world's changed now and most football clubs, you know, do their recruiting in a similar way. But, but for me back then, it was great exposure. Um. Hi, Ash. Uh, we've said before how you quite enjoy the early stages of being a club and people are about how much you're enjoying them right now and how to yeah, I think I enjoy it after of coming out the other side. No. no, I love it, mate. I love it. It's just because it's like I said. Um, I don't think anyone goes into management or, or anything you do in life thinking it's going to be smooth. There's going to be some rough moments, and you've got to be prepared for that, and you've got to enjoy that. Um, the alternative is I'm not in a job, you know, and I'm sitting on my couch and have no pressure on me, no one questioning anything. So being in a role and and Look, I'm at a fantastic football club. I'm in the, the best league in the world, getting challenged every week. Why wouldn't I be, in, be enjoying it every minute of it? But, you know, in, this, in these times, um, the reason I think I really sort of relish them is because, like I said, I, my belief gets tested on a daily basis, whether internally or externally, because invariably, even internally, people will always ask you these questions, you know, can you do this, you know, are you able to still continue to play this way or, you know, is, is it working, is it not working, all those kind of things. And, you know, when I lay my head at night, I, I just believe in it and I, I get up next day thinking I feel strongly about that. Now, you know, it might, may all end up in a heap, mate, I don't know, because there's no guarantees, but my gut tells me it won't. So I, I kind of, I do, I enjoy it. Uh, I struck with something you said a couple of weeks ago, I think after Chelsea game, when somebody asked you, is this your first big test? And you said, I don't know, maybe this is the best player in the competition as well. I was thinking, wow, I'm great. I mean, obviously, we all think Harry Kane's fantastic, but in a certain way, you think he's the greatest player to ever play in the Premier League. So, by definition, is he, is he the best that's going on? I don't think I said he was the best. I think, I, I think it was Mr. Dewey. I think he's the best ever here. Um, but he'd be, go, he'd be quite close, I reckon, Harry, um, in terms of Premier League greats. And uh, I think there's a similarity there uh, around their their ability to finish and their focus on, on you know, scoring goals, uh, really strong. Because, as we know, scoring goals is the hardest thing to do in our game, right? Um, and finding players who do that on a regular basis is is literally finding gold in our game, you know. And why it's so difficult is not so much a technical thing, even a tactical thing. It's really a mindset thing because you know as a striker you're going to miss some chances. You're not – no one – even the best strikers in the world will miss chances. And more often than not, it affects 95% of 
players who play that in that position, whether they like to admit it or not. That elite five percent just don't. You know, they've got a real laser eye focus, and and you can see that in Erling. Harry certainly got it, and and they that's why they're so rare to come along. I think it's just a real, and I experienced that even with working with H. You know, just for a little bit. You know, you watch him at training. He could put the ball exactly where he wanted to, time after time after time, and it's it's a rare sort of commodity, and you see it, like I said, with 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 Erling as well, and I'm sure as he gets more experienced and. You know, um, because you've got to understand that every game that starts, whether you're Harry Kane or Erling Haaland, the opposition is going to try and stop you. You're not hiding in the shadows. It's pretty obvious. And yet they have the strong enough mindset to overcome that. It's not an easy thing to do. Kieran, and then finish with Tom, please. Just um, remember, you going back to July 2019 when your Yorga Haaland played FC. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk to me, what can you remember of that, the build up the game itself? And then afterwards, everyone was suddenly in, in awe because it had about 58% possession. Just unheard of against him. So yeah. I find it strange everyone suddenly talking about that. Um, you know, I remember it well because. Um, and again, you know, you've got to put some context. They were in pre-season, we were kind of mid-season, so we, we, were, we were in good sort of physical condition. But it was one of those moments, a bit like, you know, what being a question today, where you can play that game and sort of, OK, you know, it was the year we won it and we were going really well and it was important. It was kind of mid-season for us. Um, and we could have gone into that game saying, OK, let's, let's see if we can beat Manchester City. Let's just see if we can beat and, you know, how can we go about trying to beat Manchester City? Or we can go in and just say, let's go play our football against Manchester City and see where that takes us. And that's what we did. You know, I just said to the boys, just let's go keep the ball, press them, be aggressive, just do what we do on a weekly basis and see. And you know what, if we get smack 6-0, we get smack 6-0, but we've measured ourselves. And we came out of that game, the players anyway, with real belief that you know, what, even against the very best. And like I said, they, they were in pre-season, so we understood that. But they felt really good about themselves, even though we lost we lost 3-1 on the day. I think it was 3-1, yeah. Um, the players felt really good about themselves. So that, that, you know, they enjoyed it. You know, they enjoyed that challenge. You know, they, they got punished because, you know, Raheem was an unbelievable player. They never faced anyone like him before, but we actually played out a few times against real good press. Real good press. We... Um, we pressured them, we made them make mistakes and, and we got belief out of it. And that's, I think, the only way you can. So um, really, you know, and, and you know, for us as a group at that time, it was it was kind of the, the perfect exercise to say that, you know, let's continue down this path. This is the team we want to be. Um, and, yeah, look, in, in the aftermath, yeah, some, some nice things were said, but then... The next day, people moved on. The circus left town, and I was left in Yokohama. Just a quick one on coming song. Mm. Stats say he's actually made more sprints than any Premier League player this season. He's also been caught offside. I think. Mm. Is it just about sort of fine tuning now that he's making those runs at the striker? Does it bring in that's sort of part of your job to try? And start? Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, some of it is still us. I think understanding. I think there's. a there's a couple of times, even last week, where just that Millie said, we could have played the get ball a little bit earlier and his timing was perfect, you know. So, you know, it's, it's part of it's just understanding because obviously Sonny's a different kind of striker than sort of Harry was who's been here for a very long time. So the players are kind of used to having a focal point is a bit different. So I think it's a combination of both. That's Sonny sort of timing. But like I said, if we pass the millisecond early, his timing's actually perfect because how are you going to catch a team, you know, unless it's... It's kind of perfect at both ends, so it's a, it's a bit of both. But you know, he's what can't what isn't undeniable is that even from offside positions, he's still finishing things. You know, he's still scoring goals, and that's still like I was saying before. That's still the hardest part of the game. I mean, I think it was the first one he's broken through. He's beaten Martinez so well on a one on one, which wasn't an easy finish. So you know the quality is there. It's just about like I said, you know, a little bit of his runs, but also us maybe seeing things just that little bit earlier. Tom, finish us off, please. What about the players have the and all that? So, what is it? Because this time, it's going to be pretty easy when you're really fine. Yeah, yeah. Loose three in a row. Yeah. That's not much harder. Not much harder, but that's what I'm talking about. So, you know, when I said before, you get through noise externally and internally. I'm sure that the players are sitting there going, well, is this going to really work? You know, is it going to work against Man City? So, they're 
and, and they're, again, they're, they're justifiable questions that they need to ask. And, and my role is to, within this process, is to, to, to kind of show them that this is still the way forward for us as a group, you know, if we're ever going to sort of bridge that gap to being a successful side, then we have to sort of, um, you know, believe in, in the kind of football we want to play. And, look, I think, you know, even though sort of the last three results haven't been great, I, I don't think, like, the players have felt like they've struggled out there, you know. I think they still felt like there were parts of the game where we were really dominant so they can see that when we're, we're on it and we're doing things right, that, you know, we're still... Even at this stage, even with so many absences, we're still a very good football team. So I don't feel like it's, you know, at a point where, you know, it's kind of I'm losing people or on the verge of losing anyone. Um, the challenge comes if it, if it stays that way, you know, if we're not getting a, a chain, you know, a turn. And like I said, when you, when you look at the sort of the first third, third of the season, you know, there are a couple of areas where we, we can be better and, you know, if we were better, we probably wouldn't have, you know, sort of had the adverse results we've had in the last three games. I talked about some very clear identity in the video We have seen some of the best coaches adapt to different teams, different points. Do any of you think that it's because you're still early in the tenure, whether it's more important or is that going to be the case No, but what I'm saying is that the plan is that you have a coach. So it doesn't mean the coach does the same thing every week or has a, you know, there were plenty of coaches who coach very differently to me, but they're at that club for four or five years and they have success. So that's what I'm talking about when I say a plan. It's not about just playing one way or having a clear identity. It's like, well, having a plan means getting the right people involved in your football club that you believe will take you where you want to do. And then you invest in them and you invest in the club, you invest in the playing squad and, and you stick to that plan. But it doesn't mean that that's just sort of exactly the same as anyone else. They're all very different. I mean, City are different to Arsenal, Arsenal are different to Liverpool, Liverpool is different to both of them. But as far as I can see, that they've got the same managers and they've gone through tough times. But they obviously saw something in them to say, well, let's... And you have to show something. It's not just about blindly appointing someone and saying, well, you've got five years. You, those managers all show um, they had a plan and the people behind them go, you know what, let's back these people. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <coughs>